2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We understand that we as Christians, we as members of the church, the body of Christ, are to study our Bible. And not only are we to study our Bible, but there is a God-ordained method of Bible study that He expects us and wants us to acknowledge in the process of that study that when we do, makes us not ashamed makes us workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. And the way you do that, according to the verse, is by rightly dividing the word of truth. By acknowledging the divisions that God has placed within His own word. Now go back with me to Ephesians 2. We've been saying this at the beginning, the outset of every one of these studies, that if you want to understand your Bible, all you really need to understand is the issue of the past, the present, and the future. That God had a way He dealt with mankind in the past, the way he's dealing with mankind today and what he calls the but now and the way he will yet deal with humanity out in what the scripture calls the ages to come. And you see this here again in Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 11. He says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, folks, we've been through eight studies, okay? We've been through eight studies going into the ninth study this morning, and we have not yet exited time past, okay? We've been in time past all the way from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We, saw, we showed the condition of the world before the, the calling out of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and we've come all the way through the Old Testament in sort of a survey overview type fashion, and we are now in the Gospels, and I tried to demonstrate to you last Sunday, and I will try to do that again for you this morning, that when you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're still where? You're still in time past. Now folks, one of the ways you know that is because the Scripture just told you in those two verses there what the characteristic of time past is. We know that in time past, the nation of Israel was nigh unto God. They had all the advantages. Go read Romans chapter 9. He talks about how to Israel pertaineth the adoption and so on and so forth. And then we have right here in verse 12, he says that the Gentiles, in verse 12, in time past, were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. So, it is a simple principle. And the principle is this, let me restate it. Anytime you go in your Bible and you see God dealing with humanity on the basis of a distinction between the Israel that is enjoying a favored standing and the Gentile nations, and God deals with humanity on the basis of that distinction, you know that you're where? In time past, okay? Now you should know that by this point as we've gone through this particular series. We've gone all the way back, and as I just mentioned, and I showed you how from Genesis 1 all the way through Genesis chapter 11, God dealt with the whole world without distinction. There was no such thing as a difference between Jew and Gentile, between circumcision and uncircumcision. It was the whole world without distinction. And we looked at the failure of man in that situation, which led to, in Genesis 12, God calling out Abraham, and God making covenantal promises and swearing certain things in a covenant to Abraham and to Abraham's seed. We then saw in Genesis 17 that the covenant that he makes with them in chapter 12, become, that he receives in chapter 17 of the book of Genesis, the sign of circumcision, which was a sign of the covenant that he had made with Abraham back in chapter 12. And that from that point forward, when God looks at the world, he sees the circumcised seed of Abraham, and he sees the uncircumcised who? Gentiles. Well, that promise that he made to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, is reconfirmed with Isaac and Jacob. And later, under Moses, the Mosaic law is added to the promise. It does not disannul the promise, it does not cancel the promise out, but it is added to it according to the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians. You're in Ephesians, look with me at verse 14, Ephesians 2 verse 14, For he is our peace who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. We studied in detail the issue of the middle wall partition. How that in time past, there was literally a dividing wall, a partition wall, that dealt, that separated the, the circumcision, the nation of Israel, from the Gentiles. There was a wall in the temple that Gentiles were not allowed to cross or go beyond. It was symbolic of this situation, okay? 
So all of this is in God's dealing with, the na- with, well, with humanity in time past. We've seen that there are two doorways in the middle wall partition, that the function of Israel in the earth in time past was to be the witness of God, to be a testimony of the Gentile nations of where God was. And if a Israel in the land keeping the law, a Gentile would look at that and say, that's where God is, and if I want a relationship with God, I need to identify myself with who? With Israel. And we saw those two walls, or two doorways in the middle wall being the issues of proselyte or converting to Judaism and or blessing the nation of Israel as is the case with Rahab the harlot. Then we further saw that later on under David another covenant is added and the Davidic covenant is added that confirms and promises that through the seed of David God would establish David's house, David's throne, and David's what? Kingdom. And that those three things would be established how long? Forever. Okay? Now, we taught in more detail on these subjects in the first eight studies. Then last Sunday, and a little bit the Sunday before, we looked at the prophetic time calendar. How God tells the nation of Israel exactly when, in the book of Daniel chapter 9, when the Messiah, the Prince, would show up in Jerusalem. And that He is cut off after the 69 weeks, but before the beginning of the 70th week. We went over the prophecy, and we laid it out, and we built it piece by piece, twice, once two weeks ago, and once last Sunday. So again, if you don't know that information, go get Lesson 7 or Lesson 8 in this particular series of studies. So all of that to say now, come with me if you would to Mark chapter 1. When you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the majority of professing Christendom thinks that as you turn the page from Malachi to Matthew, as you exit leaving the book of Malachi, the so-called Old Testament, and enter into the so-called New Testament when you turn the page of the book of Matthew, that you are all of a sudden entering into new territory. That you are entering into new ground, new information, or, a, or at least a new way of God relating to man, because church tradition says, that's the Old Testament, this is what? This is the New Testament. What we started to do last Sunday and didn't quite finish was to demonstrate to you beyond doubt that when you enter Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're still where, folks? You're still in time past. You are, God is still dealing with Israel on the basis of those distinctives that He set up all the way back there in Genesis chapter 12, 17, and and following. Okay? Now, look at Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now folks, was the kingdom back there in the Old Testament prophesied? Yes. Did God make a covenantal oath with David related to his house, his throne, and his kingdom? Yes. It's prophesied. Here comes John the Baptist now, and what is John the Baptist saying here? What is Jesus Christ going to be saying here? He's going to say, look at verse 14, He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, folks, what does the word gospel mean? It just means good news, right? So if you're a member of the nation of Israel, okay, and you've been anticipating the fulfillment of this kingdom, looking for this Messiah, looking for one that would be born king of the Jews, and so on and so forth, to enact and fulfill and establish all the prophetic promises that were made to that nation back there in the Old Testament, and here comes John the Baptist saying, Hey, This is the good news of the kingdom. Would you think that they'd be excited about that? They know about that. Well, what is the gospel of the kingdom? Look at verse 15. And saying. Notice if you would verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. If he's preaching, what's he doing? I'm preaching right now, right? Am I saying some things? So, what's the first two words of verse 15? And saying. So if you want to know the content of the gospel of the kingdom, the the content of the gospel of the kingdom is verse 15 when he says what he's saying while he's preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom in verse 14. And saying, no, watch it, number one, the time is what? Now I'm trying to impress this upon you. Okay, This is the third and last time I'm going to do it in this particular series of studies. When he says the time is fulfilled, what is he talking about? He's talking about that prophetic calendar that God laid out and established through who? 
Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. Was the time fulfilled according to the prophetic time schedule that Israel had been given for the Messiah, the King, to show up in Jerusalem? Okay? And what John the Baptist, Jesus Christ here in the passage, and the twelve apostles, as you'll see in a minute, are doing, is they are preparing Israel for the reception of the what? Of the King. Okay? So the time truly was fulfilled. Well, look at verse 15. And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is what? Now, it, what does it mean to be at hand? It's near. Why would it be near? The reason it would be near is because the time was what? The time was fulfilled for it to be what? See, they're not preaching this in Malachi's time. Daniel's not preaching this in his time, nor is Jeremiah or Ezekiel or any other guys in the Old Testament prophets. Okay? Why? Because the time is fulfilled when John's ministry begins for this to begin to be what? Well, preached and, and made known and so forth. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, come with me if you would over to Luke chapter 1. Just again, very, very quickly. Luke chapter 1. <coughs> I was glad to hear this morning Brother Tom Dibble talking about reviewing. He was, taught, he was teaching a lesson on how to teach a lesson. And he said that going over things again and again and again is a good way to get people to uh, remember things. So that's what I'm doing. I'm using appropriate teaching methods here, okay? <laughs> Luke chapter 1, look at verse 30. And the angel said unto her, this is Mary now, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shall call his name, what's his name going to be? Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father who? Folks, is this child that's going to be born to Mary some regular old kid that's just born in history? No, he is unique. He is distinct. He is going to be special. Why? Because he is going to be the one that is the fulfillment of the covenant God made with who? David. Notice what it says in verse 32. He shall be called great. He shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father who? David. Very clear. Very plain. Verse 33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob. How long? Forever, and his kingdom there shall be what? No end. You see the three issues there of the house, the throne, and the kingdom? Yep. Jesus Christ is going to give the throne of his father David, the house. He's going to reign over the house of Jacob how long? Forever. So you have the throne, the house, and the kingdom. They're all there, and they're all fulfilled in who? And Mary gets this information, verse 34, and, and then said Mary unto the angel, No, angel, you have it all wrong. The kingdom is a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men. Is that what it says? No. Does Mary understand what is going on? Yes. Okay? So the kingdom is at hand. That means, if you would look over here, please, at the chart, what is prophesied back here in the Old Testament, in Genesis through Malachi, as you now enter into the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in this section right here, the kingdom is said to be what? At hand. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Israel is being called to repent and believe the Gospel because the time was right and the outworking of God's plan with Israel for Him to bring to fruition and completion what He promised to that nation. Okay? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, folks, are still time past. Now, let me talk to you a little bit more about this. Okay? Now, we went over this a little bit last time, and uh, we're going to go through a little bit of it again here. Come over to Matthew chapter 10. Now, I asked you this question last Sunday, and somebody kind of laughed. And um, uh, How many of you think the Lord knows what He's talking about? How many think the Lord Jesus Christ knows what He's talking about? Okay, good. So if he knows what he's talking about, what does he mean when he says this here? Now, what is the fundamental characteristic of time past? The fundamental characteristic of time past is the distinction between Israel and who? The Gentiles. Okay. So if we see God dealing with humanity on the basis of a distinction between Israel and the Gentiles, what do we know? 
Okay? Verse 5. Matthew 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of who? Does Jesus know what he's talking about? And what did he just tell them? Don't go to those guys. Okay? And go not, and in, and, sorry, and in any city of the Samaritans enter you not, watch verse 6, but, contrast, but go rather to who? The house sheep of the house of, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Folks, does Israel still have an advantage here? Here is the Lord Jesus Christ commissioning his twelve apostles to go out and have their ministry, and he explicitly says to them, don't go to, you're sent to, the, you're sent to Israel, don't go to who? The Gentiles look at the next verse, verse 7, and as you go, say, and as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is what? Wow. They're there to preach the same thing that who was preaching? John the Baptist, the same thing who else was preaching? Jesus himself. Come with me to Matthew chapter 15. Come over to Matthew chapter 15. The Syrophoenician woman, I'm going to tell you the story just quickly. No, you need to read it. Verse 21. <coughs> then Jesus went thence and departed on the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying... Now, she's a woman of what? A woman of what? Canaan. She's a Canaanite woman. So is she a Gentile? Is she a Jew or a Gentile? She's a Gentile. Okay? And she comes crying out. Verse 22 cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And he answered her, Not what? Folks, when most people think of the Lord Jesus Christ, they certainly don't think that he's a rude guy. Yet here's this woman who comes to him asking for healing, and he says what? Nothing. Why would he do that? And his disciples, verse 23, came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she what? Lord, just tell her to go away. She's bothering us. Verse 24, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of who? Does the Lord know who he was sent to? Does the Lord know who he's commissioning and sending the twelve to? And who is the Lord sent to? The lost sheep of the house of... And when He commissions the twelve in chapter 10 and sends them out, who does He send them to? Okay? So is God still here dealing with humanity on the basis of a distinction where Israel possesses a spiritual advantage over the Gentile? The Lord Jesus Christ will not even talk to this woman because she's a Canaanite woman, and he is not sent to who? To her. We'll read the rest of the story. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meat. You know what the word meat is? means there? That's not talking about what you're going to eat after church. Meat there, M-E-E-T, is talking about fitting, proper. So he's saying here, but he answered and said, it's not meat, it's not fitting, it's not proper to take the children's bread and to cast it to who? She goes, the Lord Jesus Christ says, listen lady, you're a Gentile dog. Okay? And it's not meat, it's not fitting, it's not proper for me to take this bread, for me to take this ministry that is to the nation of Israel and give it to you. Woo! You didn't know he said that, did you? Verse 26. But he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Lord, you don't know what you're talking about. What would she say? She said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And isn't that true? Anybody that has a dog knows that that's true. Okay? The dog will sit there and beg and do its thing, trying to get your attention so that you'll what? Even, even a little morsel, even a little crumb, the dog wants it, right? And this is the illustration here. He is saying, and she is accepting it as the truth, that as a Gentile, she is the equivalent of a dog begging for crumbs from the table of the nation of Israel. Does the Lord correct her understanding here and say, 
You've misunderstood my ministry. Uh-oh. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And watch the Lord in verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole. See, does he ultimately heal this lady? Her daughter, I should say. Yes. But only after what? Only after this lady acknowledges and accepts her dispensational standing. Yeah, it's true, Lord. You're not sent to me. You're sent to the lost sheep of the house. It's true. I understand that that's true. And that's why he says in verse, Then she ascends and said to her, O woman, great is thy what? How did this woman know this was true? Because the Lord says she's acting in what? Faith. When she acknowledges her position at the table, as it were, the Lord explicitly states to her in verse 28 that she's doing so on the basis of what? Faith. And what he ends up actually doing here is chiding who? Read the verse. Then Jesus said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto you, uh, be, it, be it unto thee, even as thou will. And her daughter was made whole. Is this, woman, is this woman operating in, in more faith than many members of the nation of Israel were observing the Lord's ministry? Do you remember the, the slimy Pharisees who see the Lord Jesus Christ heal the girl in, in, back, back in, Matthew, in Matthew chapter 10, I believe it is, or um, 12, I can't remember which off the top of my head, but then they, they see the miracle, they see Him cast the demon out, and then they, say, they accuse Him of doing it by the power of Beelzebub. Remember that story? And then they turn around and they ask Him for another sign. You remember that? Okay? And here's a Gentile woman acknowledging her place and him healing her. Now look, we need to move on here. Okay? John chapter 4. Write down John chapter 4, verse 22. John chapter 4, verse 22 is a very straightforward verse, and it basically states, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of who? The Jews. Folks, I'm going to move on from these points because I made them last Sunday. Is the, who is the Lord sent to? He came unto... The, the verse is here, okay? The Lord is sent to the nation of Israel. John, you're in John, right? You're in John. Go to John chapter 1, look at verse 11. John chapter 1, verse 11. We'll, we'll, make, we'll look at that verse again later in a different context. But look at John chapter 1, verse 11. He came unto His own, and His own what? Received them not. We went through these verses last Sunday in Matthew chapter 20 and Mark chapter 10 when the Lord Jesus Christ says that He gave Himself a ransom for how many? Many or all? Many. We went over those things last Sunday because during this time frame, salvation was still through the nation of Israel. Okay? Now, come with me if you would to John 3.16. Yeah, preacher, what about John 3.16? That's in the book of John. What about John 3.16? John 3.16, does John chapter 1 come before John chapter 3? Does he say in John chapter 1, does he say in John chapter 1, when we just read verse 11, that he came unto his own and his own what? Received him now. Does John chapter 4 come after John chapter 3? We just read in John chapter 3, ye, uh, ye, uh, verse 22 again, ye worship, ye know not what we know that we worship, we know what we worship for salvation is of who? So the Lord Jesus Christ, he's, he comes unto his own and his own what? Receive him not, and he explicitly says that salvation is of who? Then you got this verse in chapter 3, look at, go to John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved who? The world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, uh, but have what? Every kid that's ever been to Awana knows that's a key verse of Awana, John 3.16. Am I right about I think I'm right about that. I went to Awana and I remember every year we had to recite that verse. For God so loved the world. See, 
God is dying for the sin of everyone, right? This verse contradicts the verse in Matthew chapter 20 and the verse in Mark chapter 10 where it says He only died for uh, many. This is saying He dies for the whole world. Folks, you need to understand that this verse has a what? This verse has a context. In the context of John 3.16, remember everything that we learned back there when we came through that Old Testament, right? Everything back there said, yes, God intended to save the Gentiles, but the only hope that the Gentiles had in time past was the salvation of who? Israel. So yes, it's true that God loved the world. And yes, it's true that because God loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son. All of that is still true, but you have to understand, there's a context in history of the God's dealing with humanity. The Old Testament Scriptures say that salvation was to go to the Gentiles through who? Redeemed Israel. So you have chapter 1, He came unto His own and His own received Him not. You have chapter 4, salvation is of the Jews. You have to understand chapter 3 in relationship to those contexts. Is it true that God loved the world? Yes, it's true. Is it true that God sent His only begotten Son? Is it true that God sent Him to die for sin? Yes, but according to everything that God had said up to this time and place and point in history, He was dying for who? For Israel and for any Gentile who would identify themselves with who? With Israel. We don't have time to look at all these verses. Write down Genesis chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, where he says that in you and your seed Abraham shall all nations of the earth be what? Blessed. There is no blessing in time past for the Gentiles apart from God blessing who? Israel. Write down Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 4 through 6. And Zechariah chapter 8, verses 20 through 23. And go look those verses up on your old time. And you know what you're going to find? You're going to find Gentiles being blessed through who? Through Israel. Because that's what the Old Testament required. The reason Christ can find, come with me to Romans chapter 15, the reason Christ can find His earthly ministry to Israel was because salvation and blessing were to go to the world through who? Through Israel. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, look at verse 8. Romans 15, verse 8. <coughs> now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Okay, stop there. How many think Paul knows what he's talking about? Who does Paul say Christ was? Who's the circumcision? Israel. The Lord says, I'm not sent but to who? He tells the twelve when they go out, He says, Don't go into any way the Gentiles, any city of the Samaritans, enter you not, but go rather to who? Lost sheep of the house of? Who does Paul say Christ was here in His earthly ministry? Verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto who? To confirm the promises made unto who? There's some promises that were made to the fathers. Christ comes to confirm those promises made unto who? Where the Gentiles stand in time past in relation to those promises? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12 says that they were strangers from the covenants of what? Promise. Those covenants of promise, they weren't made with the Gentiles. They were made with who? The nation of Israel, the Jewish nation of Israel. And so Paul says when the Lord comes, He comes in His earthly ministry to confirm the promises made to who? The fathers. That's who Paul says Christ was. Verse, verse 9, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy as it is written. For this cause I will confess to thee among 
uh, among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with who? With his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, uh, uh, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over who? The Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles what? So folks, the Lord, understand, Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, the nation of Israel, to confirm the promises made unto who? Because in the confirmation of the promises that God made to the fathers, in Christ confirming them to the circumcision, He is also thereby default, allowing a way for who to come in also? The Gentiles. And that is exactly what the Old Testament said would be the situation. Okay, When you are in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you are still where? You are still in time past. In addition, they are still under and subject to the law of Moses. Come to Matthew chapter 5. Come over to Matthew chapter 5. You're in Romans. I should have told you to grab chapter 6 first. Matthew chapter 5. Look with me at verse 17. Matthew chapter 5. We're not going to read all these verses. We don't have time. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Sermon on the Mount here. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to what? What does Christ... See, does that match Romans 15.8? Why, why does Christ say He came there? To fulfill What? The law or, and the prophets. Why did Paul say he came? As a minister of the circumcision, it confirmed the promises made unto who? The fathers. So are the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul in agreement about what he's doing in his earthly ministry? Whoa. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so... He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Folks, the ethical standard of the kingdom here that is being explained and expounded upon by the Lord Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount is not the principle of grace. They are all still under the what? The law. Now you understand, I hope, I hope you are seeing the problem if you are functioning as a member of the church, the body of Christ, thinking that your information and the things that you should be studying and following today as a believer are in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you are going to be gravely mistaken. Because these people here are under what? The law. You know the Lord's Prayer. Go to chapter 6. Verse 10, verse 9, After this manner, therefore pray ye, <coughs> Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our what? Uh-oh. What's the principle of forgiveness that verse is teaching? What happens if I, in that system, what happens if I don't forgive my debtors? I don't get what? Is that a different instruction about forgiveness? Hold your hand there and come over to Ephesians. Come over to Ephesians chapter 4. Come over to Ephesians chapter 4. Now look, folks, you can play mental gymnastics all day, all you want, until the cows come home to try to make these things be the same. But if you're going to read plain English, you're going to understand that what the instruction about forgiveness in Matthew 6 is conditional forgiveness. You forgive so as to be forgiven. And in, Ma in Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse um, 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed under the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and, clam and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, so that you can be forgiven. You're supposed to be yelling, no preacher. 
And be, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath what? What does Paul tell the church, the body of Christ, about how forgiveness should operate for them? Does he say, look guys, if you want to be forgiven, you better forgive. Is that what he says to the body of Christ? Is that what he says in the Sermon on the Mount? Absolutely it is. What's his instruction of the body of Christ through the pen of the Apostle Paul? You forgive someone because God, for Christ's sake, has already done what? Forgiven you. Is that a different instruction? Folks, do you see why you need to rightly divide the word of truth? You need to rightly divide the word of truth so that you can get yourself under the appropriate instructions. Okay? If I'm living today, and God has given for me today the instruction of Ephesians 4 to forgive because God for Christ's sake hath forgiven me, but I'm over here in Matthew thinking, well, this is the Gospels, this is God's Word to me, this is what I should be doing, the Sermon on the Mount is the Constitution of the Kingdom, this is what God wants me to be doing, and you're over here, and you're functioning with a mindset of conditional forgiveness, you're going to miss the point. You're going to be way off over here doing something and thinking a certain way when the whole time God's over here saying, listen, knucklehead, this is what you should be thinking. You understand that? I hope you understand that. Do we need to look at the rest of the verses? Matthew chapter, 20, Matthew chapter 23, verses 2 through 3, Jesus tells the apostles to honor those that sit in Moses' what? See. Are they still under the law? Hold your hand there and go over to Romans 6. Folks, this issue of the law, the law is so sneaky because what the law, the principle of the law is doing is, is trying to tell you that you can do certain things under the power and the energy of your own flesh. Romans chapter 6, verse, well, <clears throat> verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer? God forbid. Drop down to verse, uh, skip ahead if you would, just for the sake of time, to verse, um, why can't I find the verse about not under the law but under grace? 14, thank you. Just go to verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under what? When Paul seeks to educate the church, the body of Christ, about the functionality of their life in Christ Jesus, he says, the way this life in Christ Jesus that you've been given is not going to function on the principle and the basis of the Mosaic law of time past. But the way it's going to function, the way it's going to operate is on the basis of what? Grace. Paul says, where sin abounded, grace did what? Much more abound. He says at the end of chapter 5, that's why when you get to chapter 6, he, verse 1, he asks the next logical question, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may what? See, Paul anticipates through the use of the questioning and the logical argumentation that he's making here, that somebody is going to come to the conclusion Hey, if I'm not under the law, but I'm under grace, and we're sin abound and grace and much more abound, then by golly, I can just go do whatever the heck I want, whatever I want, and not have to face anyone. And you want to know what the truth of the matter is? The truth of the matter is, yes. Yes, that's true. But the question is, should you think, function, and behave like that? No. But anybody that's understood grace... Ought to, be, ought to be at the point here in Romans 6 where they're asking that next obvious question. Well, are you saying then that I can go into... And he goes, no, and here's why. You are identified with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. Your old man is put to death there on the cross and buried with Christ, and you've been risen again with Christ. Go walk in newness of what? Life. That's what he's saying. Is that how these guys back here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are operating? They're under what? They're under the law. John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and the twelve apostles were all preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I'm not even gonna, we're not, we're not gonna turn to these verses. I think we've established that. Okay? 
We understand that. Just look at three. Go to, Ma go to Matthew first. Go to Matthew chapter 4. Actually, no. Matthew 3, sorry. Verse 2. Verse 1. <laughs> Matthew 3, 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and what? Saying. What's he saying? Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. Come to chapter 4. Look at verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of what? What is, what is Jesus teaching? What was John the Baptist teaching? Okay, go to chapter 10. Verse 7. Christ commissions the twelve in verse 5 and commands them not to go to the Gentiles in verse 5. Verse 6, He tells them to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 7, And as ye go preaching, the kingdom of heaven is what? Folks, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and the twelve apostles, are they all preaching the exact same message? Yep. The gospel of the kingdom. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent ye and do what? Believe the gospel. The purpose of the gospel of the kingdom was to identify the believing remnant within Israel from the apostate nation. Okay? Or i.e. for the purpose of identifying what the Scriptures call the little flock. Come with me to Matthew chapter 21. Come over to Matthew chapter 21. Think about what John the Baptist begins to do. Okay? Where is John the Baptist when he's doing his baptizing? Is he in Jerusalem? No, he's out there by the Jordan River. Okay? And he's saying, you come out to who? To me. That is highly significant. Because what it means is this is not going to be a convenient thing. Anybody that wants to participate in John's message is going to have to leave the comforts of wherever they're at and go out into the boondocks, into the middle of nowhere, to this crazy-looking Unabomber dude who's eating, who's eating uh, bugs and looks like a freak. And say, this is the guy we should be listening to. Meanwhile, all the head honchos in Jerusalem are sitting there in their white robes and doing all their stuff up there at the temple and say, that guy is a maniac. Right? But there's John. And so John is calling people out to his baptism. So they have to make a conscious decision to leave all of the trappings of organized religious Israel to go out and identify themselves with what who's doing. This whole process, folks, is a mechanism whereby God determines, I don't like that word determines, whereby, whereby God identifies who the real believers are within Israel from those who are not going to what? Believe. Matthew 21. <clears throat> Verse 43. I'm going to read the whole parable, even though it means I'm not going to finish on time or get done with what I'm supposed to do, but we, you need to understand the parable. Verse 33. Here, another parable. <clears throat> there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and led it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. Think for a minute. What did God do in the Old Testament in time past? Did He come down and establish the nation? Did He give them a law? Did He give them a temple? Did He give them a priesthood? Okay? And then He entrusts the spiritual care of the nation to that priesthood that He established, and He said, okay, I've got you set up, you're a nation, you got a, you got a constitution, you got a law, you got everything you need, you got leadership here, you got what you need, now you guys do what? You run it. And you run it according to the terms of the law that I what? That I gave you. Verse 34. <coughs> and when the time of the fruit drew near, he 
He sent servants to the husbandmen. Now understand, who's the husbandman in this context? The husbandman in this context is the one that has been given the charge over the what? The vineyard over the household. Okay? So the time for the fruit to be gathered, the time of the fruit of the, uh, of the vineyard and so forth to be gathered and, and the household and, and all that sort of thing, verse 34, and when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive what? The fruits. And the husbandmen took the servants and beat one and killed another and stoned what? Folks, in Israel's history, did he send, did God the Father send prophets to Israel to call them to repent? Yes or no? And what was the reaction of the nation? Oh, Jeremiah, we're so glad that you're here. We just, we just love what you're telling us here, that the Babylonians are going to come and we're going to be... Oh, you, praise God for you, Jeremiah. Is that their reaction? No, their reaction is exactly what it says here. They beat him and kill him and stone him and so forth. Verse 36, again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them what? Likewise. Now watch the context. Verse 37, but last of all, he sent unto them his what? Son. Saying what? Now who are the husbandmen? The husbandmen are the leaders that have been established to run the vineyard and the household. Right? And he's just sent people to them to draw the fruit of the vineyard. And what was the reaction of the husbandmen? Get out of here. Right? And now he comes and he says, I got one more person I'm going to send. And the person I'm going to send is who? My son. Verse 37. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my what? Son. And when the husbandmen saw the son, they said unto themselves, This is what? This is the heir. Come, let us seize on his inheritance. Isn't it a fact that by the end, the religious leadership of the nation of Israel knew exactly who he was? They didn't believe, maybe, that he was who he said he was, but did he show, did he tell them who he was, and did he demonstrate who he was by many infallible proofs? Yes. And so here they are. Aha! Here's the heir. Here is the rightful heir of the vineyard. Here is the rightful heir of what has been entrusted to us. You know what? <laughs> we can seize on his inheritance, and we can take what rightfully belongs to him and transfer it to who? Us. Because is it not true that men do not like to give up the power that they have been entrusted with? Verse 39, and they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard. And what? Folks, does the nation of Israel crucify their Messiah as a common Roman criminal? And slew him. <clears throat> Verse 40, <clears throat> when the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do? Unto these what? Husbandmen. They shall say unto him, <clears throat> he will, he will, uh, They shall say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will, not, now watch this, and will let <clears throat> out his vineyard unto other what? Husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their what? So, the original husbandman to whom the vineyard was entrusted, are they going to lose their position of authority in the vineyard? Why? Because they kill who? The son. And so God is going to take the authority that He gave and entrusted to those original husbandmen, according to verse 40, and He's going to entrust it to a new set of husbandmen that will bring forth what? The fruit. <clears throat> verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the Scripture the stone which the builders rejected? The same, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes, all of that to get to verse 40. 
Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken, what? From you. Now watch. And given to a nation. Singular. Not what? Not plural. And given to a nation that will do what? Bring forth fruits what? You need to understand what's going on here. Who's he talking to in that context? He's talking to the, religious, the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders of the nation of Israel. And he, at the end of the parable, he looks them straight in the eye and he says, you guys right here, the kingdom of heaven is going to be taken from you and given to who? To this nation. This is not Gentiles. He's not going to give it to the Gentiles, but because if it were the Gentiles, it would have said nations. But it said what? It said nation singular. So the original husbandmen in Israel that had been trusted with the care of the vineyard are going to lose it, and that care is going to be given to who? Someone else, for now. Let's just say someone else, a nation. Someone else. Come to Luke 12. Go over to Luke chapter 12. Verse 30. <clears throat> now watch. For all these things do the nations. Does God and the Holy Spirit know the difference between nation and nations? Okay. Nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye need of these things. Verse 31. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be what? Verse 32, Fear not who? Little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the what? Who's He going to give it to? So, the authority of the vineyard that was given to the original husbandman they are going to lose that authority because of their conduct, because of their stewardship, because of the way that they dealt with and, 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 and or didn't bring forth the fruit of the vineyard. And so they're going to, their part in the kingdom is going to be lost, and it's being given to a new set of husbandmen that will bring forth the fruit thereof. Who, according to Luke 12, inherit is going to receive the kingdom then? It's not going to be the religious leadership of the nation of Israel. It's going to be this group he identifies as who? The little flock. Go to Matthew 19. Matthew chapter 19, verse 27. Then Peter answered and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have done what? Followed me in the regeneration. When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging who? Folks, chief among these members of the little flock was going to be who? The apostles. Now I have a question. How does God identify? Now understand, you put, put all this thinking together with me now. Okay, You have Israel at large. Okay, Within Israel at large are all of the people, all of the blood descendants of Abraham, Israel at large, are they all believers? No, they are not. Okay, Even the upper echelons of the leadership of the nation were they believers. No. So how is God going to determine who this little flock is within this massive nation of unbelievers? How is this going to be determined? How is it going to be decided? It is going to be determined by the preaching of the gospel of what? The kingdom. John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, the twelve... They're going to go out and preach the gospel and accompanying the, the, and accompanying 
the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom is this little thing that, re that the religious world loses their mind over called baptism. Okay? This identification of the believing remnant, okay, stresses the importance of water baptism in the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. I'm going to give you these two verses and we're going to quit here for this week. Go to Mark chapter 1. Folks, if you've been around Christianity for any length of time, you know that there's one subject that nobody can agree on. Okay? And that's the subject of baptism. They all agree that water is somehow important, but they can't agree on how you should be water baptized. Should you be dunked or sprinkled? They can't agree on when you should be baptized as an infant, as an adult. When should you be baptized? Uh, there's all sorts of disagreement. If you get ten preachers and you ask them all to tell you what they believe about water baptism, you're going to get twelve different answers. Okay? So I just want to read some verses and ask some questions. Mark chapter 1, and this will, this will be where we leave off for next time. Mark chapter 1, verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness. See, there it is. Where is John doing this at? He's out in the back of beyond. He's out in the boondocks. He's out in... Where I live in Greenville, there's a road. I used to make fun of this road every time I drove by it to work. The name of the road is Podunk. And I used to say to my wife, ah, good thing we don't live on Podunk. Now it's the next road over. Okay. He says... John did baptize in the wilderness and preach. So he's baptizing and preaching. The, now watch. The baptism of repentance for what? For what? Now look, folks. Does that imply that this baptism is significant with respect to the remission of sins? Yes or no? Come over to Luke chapter 7. Now, I'm just going to, as it were, wet your whistle on this and make you come back next week to hear the rest of it. Luke chapter 7. Verse 29. And all the people... This is talking about John. You need to see that. Go to verse 28. For I say unto you, among these that are born of women... Uh, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist... But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all, Now watch verse 29. And all the people that heard him, that's John, and the publicans, justified who? How? How did they justify God in that verse? Being baptized with the baptism of who? Is there something significant about a bap the baptism of John that was setting certain people apart from the rest of the nation of Israel? Okay? So this, the mechanism by which the little flock is going to be identified has something to do with this baptism that is accompanying the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. Now look at verse 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers did what? What did they do? They rejected the counsel of God against themselves. How? How did they reject the counsel of God against themselves? Being not baptized of who? So folks, what do, you, what do you have here? John is drawing a line in the sand in Israel. And he's saying, this is what God is now calling Israel to do, to repent. And part of that repentance is this washing with what? Water. This water baptism. And the people that submitted to what John was doing there, according to Luke, did they justify God? Did they do what was necessary to be identified with the believing remnant? The people that didn't, verse 30, but the Pharisees and lawyers, what did they do? See, understand, look at what's going on. Do they refuse to submit to John's baptism in verse 30? Yes or no? Do they refuse to submit? Yes, and by refusing to submit, what are they doing? 
They're rejecting the counsel of God against who? Against who? Themselves. They are identifying themselves by their refusal to submit to that baptism as someone that was standing against and apart from what God was doing in Israel then. You understand that? Does that mean then that that baptism truly was then for the remission of sins? In other words, is that baptism drawing a line between apostate Israel and believing Israel? Yeah. We're out of time. So what we're going to do next week is finish this thought. But you need to understand something here. Okay? Religion has all sorts of tradition about water baptism. And I'll leave you... What do, what, what, what do people say about water baptism? They'll say, brother, you need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Christ was baptized. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. You need to be water baptized because it's an outward sign of an inward commitment. Show me one verse in the Bible that says that. Is there a single verse in the Bible that says that's what water baptism was for? No. That is churchianity telling you what they think you need to do. There is not a verse in Scripture that says that's what water baptism was for. Are there a whole lot of verses that we're going to look at next time that say that what God was doing in water baptism was identifying who would be the kingdom of priests and the holy nation that God required Israel to be? Why is the Lord baptized? Okay? What does the book of Hebrews call the Lord Jesus Christ? The great what? High priest. Do you understand that back there in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus and so forth, that there are requirements of what has to happen to somebody before they can function in the office of a priest? And guess what one of them is? They've got to be washed with what? Water. We'll get into that next week. The only Father, we thank you once again for your word. Lord, we pray that we'll understand this morning that the testimony of Scripture is plain. That Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the execution of your prophetic plan in the nation of Israel. The church, the body of Christ, is not found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are a continuation of prophetic events that were spoken of by the mouth of the holy prophets since the world began. We understand that this sets us apart from the rest of organized Christianity who wants to find its instruction and its marching orders in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, thinking that those are the instructions that God wants us to follow today. Lord, we pray that as we are careful to rightly divide the word of truth, we will understand that the point of change, the point of division, does not happen between Malachi and Matthew, but it happens at some point subsequent to the cross. As the, Lord, as the nation of Israel demonstrates its abject failure to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. We pray that in this we'll understand clearly, maybe for the first time, what water baptism was and what it was for. And we're grateful, as always, for the saints that have gathered here to hear your word preached. And Lord, all we ask for by any that may be hearing that has never heard this before is that they give us a fair hearing that they allow us to take what we're saying here, and yes, saying with, with authority and conviction from Your Word, and allow us to lay out and demonstrate clearly from the verses all that there is to say about the matter before they decide. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.